Hello, peoples, and welcome to Esoterica Cinema, the podcast where we usually take two random films from the cinematic universe and discuss the hell out of them, but not today, because today's not a full episode. Today's a half episode, because at the end of the day, full episodes are a lot of work, and uh, if you know us, we're not people that like to work. Uh, before we begin, I would like to remind all of our listeners that this is a cinema discussion podcast as opposed to a review program, and that dictates that there's going to be spoilers. If you haven't seen the film that we're about to look at today, you can feel free to go ahead and stop this. It is available online via streaming, a few different outlets. It's actually available for free on Amazon Prime. And the film that we're going to be looking at today is 2019's Guns Akimbo. So once again, for free on Amazon, if you do have a Prime subscription, go ahead and check it out. Come back. We're going to have a great show today, and uh, let's get on with it. My name is Jason Peters, and normally... I have my co-host Ryan Siebold, who you all know very well, and he couldn't be here today. So for today's episode, we actually brought in a good friend of mine. Uh, he's actually a fellow author, and his name is Ashton McCauley. How you doing, Ashton? Hey, thanks for having me, Jason. I'm excited to be here. Super excited about this movie, too. I'm a big Daniel Radcliffe going bizarre fan, so this was right up my alley. Yeah, man, it's, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, you know, obviously a lot of people comment on where his career's gone since Harry Potter, and I just don't think any of us expected it to be quite as bizarre as it is. Uh, this is a guy that's taken a ton of chances yeah. out there. Yeah, I mean, uh, we, we actually um, uh, did Swiss Army Man on this uh, program as well. So uh, this is our second Daniel Radcliffe film, which is pretty interesting. Did you catch that one, Ashton? Yeah, I, I love the Swiss Army Man is what cemented Daniel Radcliffe as an actor for me after Harry Potter. And I mean, you know that his career was going to go in a weird direction when like the first thing he did after making those children's films was to, you know, hang dong on stage uh, during a play when he did Equus. Like with the, with that the was horse, a good right? indicator of where his career was going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was the one with the horse, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The very famous photo where everybody was like, oh, there goes my childhood. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and, and he's a good actor, too. I mean, he's it's unfortunate because I think that the roles that he chooses and the movies that he chooses to take part in are just not the type of movies that are ever going to get serious consideration for award season, not even Golden Globes, let alone Oscars, right? But he is really good at these different roles. I mean, he's playing, you know, in this film, like a younger character. So you're not getting this super, you know, depth of character with this big emotional arc. But like he's doing these like funky, just at left of center roles and he's doing them really well. Yeah, you know, I think that he probably got tired of blockbusters. Like, I, I know that, you know, listening to him talk, Harry Potter was really taxing on him. Like, he was an alcoholic, doesn't remember filming, you know, the seventh movie, at least mm -hmm. pieces of it. So he had to, like, break into something different. And, I, you know, even if it's little weird movies that he's not getting much acclaim for, I think he's had enough time in the spotlight for, like, ten <laughs> actors. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, he's He's never been in danger of being underexposed, that's for sure. All right, man. Well, let's go ahead and get into it. But before we actually get into the movie itself, I do want to bring up something that I thought was pretty funny, which is that, like, this movie apparently had, like, 1,763 production studios responsible for financing or something. I, I'm pretty sure the first four and a half minutes of this movie is just production studio animations and logos. Like it, there was like so yeah. many of them, dude, and it was like uh, I don't know. Do you? Uh, I don't know if you ever watched Family Guy. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, totally. Yeah. Do you remember the? Uh, do you remember the scene where he goes to the movies and it's like uh, the movie's about to start, and then all the production company animations and logos keep popping up, and he keeps thinking it's the actual movie that's about to start. So it'll be like, okay, you know, here we are in the water. Okay, got ourselves a C movie coming. Oh no, wait, that's just the production company. All right, okay, you know, here we are. Uh, now there's a guy coming out of the rain. Oh, this is going to be spooky. Oh, no, wait, it's just another production company. Like, that's kind of how I felt at this movie for a minute. Because then when it actually does start, it's like that super animated virus schism thing that to me kind of reminded me of Max Headroom. I don't know if you remember that. Max Headroom? Yeah, Max Headroom, dude. I know you're uh, you're a little you're a little baby and you're in, still in your 20s. You know, you <laughs> You don't you don't know the old eighties references like us old ass cats in our thirties and maybe upward, who's to say? But uh yeah, it was this like old like it was one of like the first computer generated just like weird ass television shows. 
and it was this like computer program that was represented as like a human uh, named Max Headroom, who actually was played by Matt Frewer, if you know who that is. Uh, a lot of people only know uh, know him as the uh, neighbor from uh, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, but he's actually a, uh, a oh, really funny man. guy. Yeah, yeah, and and like that takes I, me way back. I'm sure it was just the product of like way too much cocaine. I mean, this was like early '80s, and it's got like that neon vibe. But the cool thing is that like he was a human actor who was playing a computer program, and so he would like do these like stutter things, like as if like you know the 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 computer program was like skipping or something like that. And and it was like it was it was it was absolutely crazy. I think they made a movie on it. I never saw it. It's called Max Headroom. If anybody listening wants to go check that out, probably get you know really drunk or really high or both before you do because I think it's batshit crazy. It's I only remember it from my childhood. To be completely honest. So yeah, there you go. Ashton. You know, honestly, I would recommend both those things for this film too. Uh, <laughs> this would be this would be a great movie to be blazed through. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of bright colors and fast edits, and you know, you definitely don't have to worry about getting yeah. bored and falling asleep or anything like that. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and jump into the actual film itself. So when it starts, you know, it pretty much this is one of those films. Uh, that lets you know what it is right off the bat. And actually, before we discuss it, I do have the trailer. So why don't uh, I go ahead and play the trailer, just in case there is anybody that's still listening that hasn't seen the program. It'll give you a little sense of what the program is about, um, or rather what the movie is about, and sort of just its general vibe and tone, etc. So let's listen real quick to the trailer for Guns Akimbo. Someone's trying to kill me! Please, go drive! I'm Miles, and this is the story of the worst day of my life. Another schism. 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 Schism Schism picked random psychos, weirdos, and criminals and made them fight each other to the death. So the internet loved it. (laughs) And then I came into the picture. You scared yet? Welcome. To schism. They bolted these things to my hands. They have my girlfriend. And some psycho is trying to kill me. I'm not a fighter. I'm a nobody. Hey, 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 I need help. Oh, it's one thing to say you can't face violence, but when it faces you, you better be ready. When the shit goes down, you better be ready. You better be ready. Right, yeah. Yeah. Stop shooting at me! I gotta kill you. Schism said they would wipe my sleep. No, Schism is gonna kill us both. No! I have a plan. It is totally suicidal, but it might work. Car, please come on please get out thank you <laughs> thank you very much sorry <laughs> oh, of course <laughs> oh, did I win? So yeah, Ashton, so I think that gives us a pretty good vibe. You know, it definitely captures the mood of the film. Um, So when we start off, you know, it's got that virus thing that I was saying, that the Max Headroom thing that comes out. And then immediately it goes to like this violent car chase and this chase is being live streamed. And there's all these people that are watching it through their computer and through their phone. And Ashton, I'm sure you had to love, this thing's filmed like a video game. It makes a lot of video game references. And you are actually, uh, you may make a living in the video game world, do you not? Yeah, I can't say which company, uh, because <laughs> I am prohibited from doing that on podcasts, actually, as, as part of my contract. But yeah, I have worked in the game industry for a long time, and it was really interesting. So, you know, in the beginning of the movie, he's working for a mobile gaming company, and I have friends who, who have done that, who have specifically worked for, like, casino games or... Mm-hmm 
things on your phone that are designed to make you spend money. Yeah. And that's not far off. The, the <laughs> office would be a little nicer. They, they tend to shower you with gifts so that you forget you're losing your soul. It's a really good strategy. But now, uh, other than that, they, they nailed it. Did he mention, did he talk about and, his boss uh, at all? How much was his boss like the boss in this in this movie? So I've never seen a bro boss that bad like there's definitely (laughs) programmers right like that's a that's a that's a group of people that totally exist in tech but i've never seen a bro boss that bad and i've had some pretty terrible bosses mostly they're the the subtle kind of manipulators though not necessarily the uh big dumb jock who's gonna come up and pretend to fire you yeah yeah (laughs) it's like there's such such a crazy intro for that that character too yeah, but, which is, I mean, but yeah, that, uh, let's be honest. I mean, that's fitting for a movie like this. Like, this movie is unapologetically over the top right out of the gate. Everything about it is pushed to 11. So why not have this big, ridiculous caricature of a boss, right? Like, none of this is real, so literally none of it has to be real, including the boss. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, it, it's funny. Like, throughout throughout the intro, it struck me as... Similar to the trailers I've been seeing for Free Man, that Ryan Reynolds film, that's uh, it's, I think it's delayed to December now because of Corona. Mm-hmm. But it, uh, Free Man is it's about a person living inside of a video game, and then the aesthetic of Guns Akimbo is very similar. Yeah, yeah, that's that's definitely what I noticed and and what I sort of bring it up. So it definitely, at least initially, and then it kind of arguably falters halfway through but uh at least initially there's a lot of sort of video game references there's a lot of video game sound effects every every time you know somebody kills somebody there's like a coin sound effect that goes up like mario when he stomps a goomba or something like that um there was a nice actually i liked the way that they used it in this one moment later when he needs to get his inhaler and he's trying to get an inhaler i think maybe nix is is preventing him and then he finally gets it and like blasts it and you hear like ching and so there's a lot of like little sort of cool, clever moments like that that utilize those video game sound effects to pretty good effect. That being said, it's probably fairly limited in its usage of it. Um, this is a film that's, you know, yeah. really bright, really vivid, really colorful, hyper stylized. So, again, all of that sort of fits in with this sort of video game nature. And very early on, we're introduced to our protagonist. Uh, the protagonist's name is Miles, played by Daniel Radcliffe. He is a programmer and a gamer, but in addition to that, Ashton, he's also a professional troll. Yeah, yeah you know, I didn't know that that was something I could get good at, but they certainly do show him. He, he puts in the work for that <laughs> job. And I think, like, their their portrayal of streaming culture, so, you know, we, we've talked about this, I think, a little bit before Street streaming is, you know, you're watching people kill fake people online and people get really tilted about it. And the comment sections are just vile cesspools. <laughs> and they got that right. The only thing they did is swapped it out for real people. And to be honest, that's actually like not the most far fetched thing in this film. I could 100 percent see if there was some place you could stream people killing each other live. This sort of audience would be there for it. It's. It's a it's a very accurate portrayal of streaming culture, just with the trolls and everybody having their favorite person that they root for and feeling like they are that person or just the keyboard warriors in general. It's crazy. It's it's one of the things they did the best, honestly, in terms of their portrayal of gaming. Yeah, I do agree. Now, the one thing I will say about that is earlier on, you know, when the film starts off, by the way, let's just acknowledge as well that like this is a film that puts all of its cards on the table right out of the gate like so much so (laughs) (laughs) like so much so that i think it doesn't really leave itself like much room to go um or to to, to develop to grow there's not really a lot of like rising tension or anything because they just went all in you know minute 12 of the film right so um but uh one of the things that i thought was interesting about the film is it kind of set it up as though it was going to be a bit more of a commentary or a satire on that world. I thought that initially it was sort of like the way the Truman Show did for television, but for video games, that it was going to kind of explore that a little bit more. I don't think it ultimately did. I think it was I think I think it was a film that tried to have its cake and eat it too. It does these little allusions for being satirical, but then it doesn't really go anywhere with them, you know what I mean? Yeah, totally. And it's interesting to look at. So you look at something like 
I'm comparing it to Deadpool because it's just the same sort of action, but Deadpool is pretty clearly satirizing its genre. This, it feels like, goes in between like lampooning these hor- horrific acts of violence in movies and stuff like that, and mm-hmm. then just embracing them yeah. and, and being gun porn. Definitely. Yeah, that's exactly how I felt about it, too. And so, and I think it's one of those things where there's probably, like, I don't really know too much about the guy that made the film, but probably fair to say that he's a gamer. He seems like he would definitely have that sensibility. And so I think there's a thing that happens where when somebody tries to satirize something that they love, they kind of can't help but allow their love for that thing to shine through even when they're trying to poke fun at it. And I think that's kind of what happened with this one, you know? Yeah, 100%. Like, when you're trying to look at something... I think you, you you think to yourself, oh, I've 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 lampooned it enough, and now I can just kind of lean into it. Like people know it's a satire at this point, mm-hmm. and then you you kind of stop biting into it. Yeah, and that's really because this movie, like you said, does lay its cards on the table immediately. It almost feels like it would have made a great short film for the first forty five minutes. Yeah, definitely. But then it just kind of re- it just kind of repeats itself and does the same thing over again. It, it has no new tricks. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So. So let's go ahead and jump back to the film itself. So early on, like we said, we've got our protagonist, Miles. Uh, he's a professional troll, you know, sits around drinking a bunch of beer. There's this online game called Schism that everybody is uh, is a part of. It's the game that everybody's watching. And for those that haven't seen the film, basically they find someone at random or they make them participate in this game. And it's basically just like a death match. Uh, two people, you know, just basically have to kill each other. And it's happening in real life. And there's this whole, you know, underground sort of operation with these gangsters. And they've got the cops paid off so that this is allowed to go on. And so because of that, you know, we do get a lot of these video game correlations. As a gamer, I can say that, like, a lot of this game reminded me of, like, Twisted Metal. Like, just the whole nature of, like, driving around and then trying to shoot. Which I always sucked at that game, by the way. I always loved the aesthetic of Twisted oh, man, Metal. Me too. Like, I was a game I wanted I to be good at so bad. I loved Twisted Metal, though. <laughs> yeah, dude, it uh, was I fun. wish that game franchise would come back. That's, like, my number one. When they were revealing the PS5, I was like, please, God, give me a Twisted Metal game. <laughs> give me a new Twisted Metal. And they just, they didn't deliver. They, got, they had a lot of cool stuff, but no Twisted Metal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then uh, the, the aesthetic, it was kind of like a... It was like Call of Duty, but also with like a, you know, sort of post-apocalyptic vibe. So it reminded me maybe of like Rage or something like that. So there's actually a game called Bulletstorm that this kind of reminds me of where that one is specifically like a game that lampoons toxic masculinity and has over the top. It's it's very similar to Rage, too, in the way that they do their like big explosions of guts and things like that. But this movie specifically kind of reminds me of the constant kinetic movement and like over the top explosions and people flying everywhere. It's yeah, they're very similar. Yeah, definitely. So as the movie goes on, Miles is sitting there and he's trolling, you know, the people on schism, blah, blah, blah. And then the admin reaches out to him and, you know, he decides to puff up his chest and talk shit to them. And then they attack him. And at first it's a digital attack. And then it's a very physical, very real sort of attack. And they show up to his house and they beat his ass and then the next thing you know, he is waking up with guns literally bolted to his hands. Uh, it was funny, too, the way that, you know, they incorporate a lot of this sort of first-person shooter type of camera work. I don't know if you played the Doom reboot, but a lot of the camera work reminded me of the Doom reboot. Yeah, totally. It is it is very much so, like, they, they make it like a video game. They do a good job of getting that feel down. And one of my favorite parts about him first waking up is they kind of juxtapose him preparing versus Nick's preparing. Yeah. And I, I'm a big fan of shots like that where they go back and forth between the two characters. I almost wish it had gone on a little bit longer because that was one of the funnier parts of the movie. But just him, like, trying to learn how to piss with guns on his hands. <laughs> one of the one of the funniest scenes in the movie. Like, that's amazing. <laughs> it's just things I would have never thought about that I'm like, oh, my God, that would really suck. <laughs> <laughs> that was a, that was a, quite a funny moment, yeah. And there were some aspects of this film that I did find to be more inspired than I initially thought. So with a film like this, you kind of expect a lot of the heavily saturated color schemes, a lot of the fast editing a lot of camera motion. Uh, what I thought was nice, though, is that there was actually a lot of um, 
not a lot, but there was more long takes than I expected, which I thought was kind of cool. Probably also budgetary reasons, keep things moving along. But like, so the whole sequence with him waking up where he does have the guns, I found that to be really effectively shot. And they kind of, it's like a, I don't know, it's probably something like a five minute take or something like that. Um, where it's just sort of like looking at him, you know, I don't know if it's like a fixed camera position or what it is, but he's sort of center in the frame and it's got this very sort of ethereal dreamlike visual quality. And, you know, why he's just trying to sort of make sense of everything that's going along and waking up with these guns on his hands. So there was a couple moments where when it wasn't so busy being just like a 14 year old's wet dream that it actually did have some artistry to it, but kind of like the same way with the social commentary aspect of it. It's just these little brief moments and you know, the guy can't help but be like, all right, let's get back to like guns and explosions and death and cocaine and whatever else is in there. Yeah. It's funny. You mentioned the long takes too, because I feel like most of this movie is very quick cuts. There's a lot of them. Yeah. Like I, I compared it to like, so I, I have attention deficit disorder and this movie totally gets me. It, it's like being inside, inside my brain. It's like watching violent ADD, the movie It a hundred percent. Like it gets that sort of frenetic energy and it's, it's just hard to follow yeah. at sometimes because it's so it's, it's so jumping all over the place. And in that sense, it actually feels more like Nix's movie than it is miles yeah. because Nix. And I, I don't know if we introduced her yet, but she's played by Samara Weaving, and Samara Weaving is actually Hugo Weaving, Mr. Smith's I was uh, going to ask, dude, because like she totally kind of yep. looks like him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they totally share that aesthetic. But it, the, the movie is like, it's so she's the one that Miles is paired up against to fight in, uh, in Schism. Mm -hmm. And I honestly think the movie's aesthetic, it fits her so well because she's from the Schism world and Miles is like this outsider. Yeah. But she fits in with the art style like the bright neon colors you know she's addicted to stimulants so it kind of fits with like the constant jumping around she can't pay attention for five seconds during the movie unless she's shooting something which feels a lot in line with what the director was feeling as well yeah so kind of works out <laughs> well and you know to be at the end of the day we don't know like maybe the writer director uh does have add maybe he does a lot of cocaine because nix does a lot of cocaine in this movie <laughs> <laughs> As a matter yeah, of fact, you, know, you never know <laughs> there's the one uh when she when she attacks him in his in his apartment or whatever and she literally walks in and there's just a rolled up dollar bill sticking out of her nostril as she's like firing at him and it's like once again we are not here for subtlety this guy is not interested in making quiet statements that you're gonna have to ruminate on he is just bam here i am guys yeah, that was such a great introduction to that character. Like, just her walking with, like, kind of a lazy assault rifle, you know, up in the air and a cocaine dollar bill coming out of her nose. And, I mean, the damn movie <laughs> takes place in Shrapnel City as well, which kind of shows his intentions from the very beginning. Definitely. As uh, you, It's funny, as you're saying it right now, it actually sounds like it would be something out of, like, Borderlands the R-rated cut. A hundred percent. Yep. One of the other things that I like about this film, Ashton, is the way that it uses color. So obviously we get a lot of that like super high saturation and that's to be expected in a film like this. Again, it's kind of like this is a movie that's like a syringe full of meth just straight to your neck. So, of course, the colors are just going to be like jammed way up. <laughs> right. But um, but there's also some really like some more sort of artsy, you know, artistic uses of color. Um, like the jail, for example, the prison, I thought was really well shot the way that they sort of cast it in this deep blue. And then there would just be these like pockets of red. It almost felt like a it almost felt like a shot from like Last Jedi or something, which regardless of what you think is a gorgeous film. Right. So there's some really excellent use of lighting in this film color, in addition to just everything being, you know, that bright, saturated, candy coated sort of visual aesthetic. Yeah, yeah, and it's it comes down to the, like the way the characters dress too. Not not even just the sets, but like the characters themselves mm -hmm. all have these different visual colorations to them. So you know instinctively, I, I know that instinctively on a moment to moment basis, you know who you're looking at just because of the color scheme, and that's really mm -hmm. important when a movie's cutting back and forth this quickly, because if you're if you're needing to follow the action, you you have to be able to figure out who the character is immediately. Yeah. No, that, that, that's a really strong point. Yeah, I thought the film 
So it's interesting that you say that. I didn't necessarily pick up on that, but that's definitely a really good point. The one thing that I was impressed with is a lot of times when you get these films, they somehow, f they, they feel like they have to move and cut as fast as possible with regards to the camera. So it's one thing to be a fast edited film. It's another thing to be a handheld sort of shaky cam film, right? But then these films try to do both. And it's just like, there's, you know, it's like, I've been watching three minutes of an action scene. I can't tell what the hell's going on. I don't know logistically where anyone is in relation to each other. I can't see all of these super cool, you know, kung fu moves or uh, cool gunshot battles, whatever it is that you're offering me, right? So for as much as this film was over the top and just, I don't think, I, at the same time, I don't think it's fair to say that it was reckless. I think that it did manage <laughs> i'm gonna use the word restraint though that feels like the last word that i should be using yeah. <laughs> with a movie like this <laughs> but i do think yeah. that he exercised just enough restraint to where he like pushes it as far as he can without it just kind of getting to be too much you know what i mean like i didn't have i was exhausted by the end but i didn't have a headache if that makes sense yeah, and you know, I think they did a good job of breaking it up because if it had been an hour and a half straight, it would have been it would have been a slog. Yeah. But they have that nice palate cleanser right in the middle when he runs into to Rise Darby as his crazy homeless person persona. Absolutely. That is it's a, it's such a wonderful breath of fresh <laughs> air in between two solid chunks of like 45 minute action and I I will watch I will watch Rise Darby in in anything right he he is fucking fantastic and hilarious <laughs> yeah i'm glad that you brought that up ashton because i actually do have a clip of that as well so let's go ahead and take a break from this super frenetic pacing and listen to rice darby wax philosophic and just be a crazy little crackhead i wouldn't do that if i was you huh Why shouldn't I? Well, the angle's all wrong. You won't hit your brain. You'll just end up blowing your damn face off. Oh. Okay, thanks. And then you'll still be depressed. Even more depressed, probably, because of your fucked up face. Try and angle it right to the rear base of the head. Okay? Okay, you know way too much about this. Just trying to be helpful, ma'am. Hey, look, this is going to sound really fucking weird, but could you help dress me? I have guns bolted to my hands. This whole deal. Yeah, you're right. That does sound pretty fucking weird. You want a double bow on that, buddy, or...? Uh, that should be fine, thanks. Fuck, brother. Sounds like you're in some deep shit. Yeah, I just... I, I can't face violence, you know, not... Not in real life. Hey, you don't have anything to eat, do you? Well, let's have a look at the pantry. Oh, here we go. Half a cold hot dog. Um, you, you don't have a vegetarian option, do you? So, you don't believe in uh, violence or eating meat? I don't like uh, contributing to the, the suffering in the world, I guess. Well, that's a great philosophy, man, but most people in the world, they just eat whatever they can get. And it's one thing to say you can't face violence, but when it faces you, you better be ready. You a Citrus Hill fan? Who? When the shit goes down, you better be ready. You better be ready! Right, yeah. Yeah. Okay, fuck it. Can you just push it into my mouth? So like you said, Ashton, it's a great scene. Kind of allows us to slow down a little bit. You know, we still get a lot of that, you know, the, the colors and the visual aesthetic. Like, that doesn't go anywhere. You know, even though it's supposed to be some back alley and he's a homeless person, like, everyone's still wearing... You know, all all the primary colors, basically, and the complementaries and everything on the color spectrum. Like, yeah, he's still got his multicolor hat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, that fucking scene of him picking up the hot dog. Like, <laughs> again, like for some reason, the funniest parts of this movie are me are, are him trying to use his hands. Yeah, like that. I, I like I don't know why, but that gets me on a primal level. It's the like maybe it's the Three Stooges in me. It's it's just the fun. It's the funniest shit watching him try and eat a garbage hot dog that is you know however many months old with gun hands. <laughs> I'm into it. Yeah, right. And so to anyone listening, if that sounds like your style of humor, you're gonna enjoy this film. 
If that sounds like the last thing you'd ever want to watch, no need. Just listen to this, move along to the next thing. I'm sure we'll have some artsy films for you coming up soon. No, it's not at all. It does, it does have a certain artistry to it, but it is definitely not an art film. There there are no visual metaphors for anything, you know. The uh, the guns attached to his hands are not a metaphor for the addiction that's holding his life hostage. Like, this is just a balls-to-the-wall action movie. Oh, what if it was, though? What if that was the metaphor, Jason? <laughs> Maybe we're not giving we him enough it. credit, you know? We missed it. Yeah. <laughs> the whole time it was right there. Like, right now, you know, the guy that made the movie is like, finally! He's listening to us, apparently, because I don't know that he's going to get any work after this. I saw that this... By the way, I don't know if you saw this. This movie made, like... Six hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars, or something, at the box office. Oh no! Is that like how on earth? That's real bad, dude. Here's the thing. Like, I read this and it shot. Like, I, and first of all, look. Fair warning. Like, I did not verify this, right? So it, this could be some fake news, you know, for sure. But like, if you go on Google, it tells you that this movie made six hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars, and like everybody knows this movie. Right. Like there's a lot of people that haven't seen this movie, but everybody knows at least of Guns Akimbo. And you're telling me that a movie that everybody knows of didn't even make a million dollars at the box office. Yeesh, that's rough, man. So here's the thing. I didn't even know it had. Re- I assumed that it, it got pushed straight to digital because of coronavirus. I didn't realize it had a box office run <laughs> because I'd been waiting for this. Mo- I had been waiting for this movie to come out. And I was like, oh, it's on streaming. Oh, we're going to watch it for the podcast. This is great. <laughs> it had a fucking box office run. Yeah. No, it wasn't playing anywhere near me. It was released in 2019, dude. It's a 2019 film. How do you not get people into seats when you say Harry Potter gets guns stapled to his hands for, you know, an hour and a half film? That's all you should be, have to say. <laughs> yeah. Clearly, and- film goers just don't understand and they would rather go watch Little Women. Uh, <laughs> well, it was also weird, too, because, like, they had what seemed to be a really effective social media campaign. Everybody was, you know, tweeting that picture, which they even do in the movie. I thought that was a cool little sort of meta self-referential moment where, you know, they're like, hey, you're the Guns Akimbo guy. And they show the tweet that, like, we all were responding to in real life where he's in this bathrobe, like, holding the guns up, like, pleading with the guy in the car. Yeah, it got memed to hell. Yeah. Like, I don't understand. It was a top, it was a top quality meme. <laughs> wow, that's really sad. And, like... I, I hope that that doesn't discourage... I mean, Daniel Cryocliffe has, has fuck all money, so he should be yeah. fine. I hope he still does weird shit like this, but... <laughs> I mean, it's not it's not a bad movie. Like, it, no. it should have made more than that at the box office, especially with the shit that does do well, like Suicide Squad or... I don't know. Yeah, no. I was going to say Venom, but I like I like Venom, yeah. so... I, I, we, I, think, I think everybody has the same opinion of Venom, which is like, totally going to admit to you that it's a shitty movie, and I'm totally going to admit to you that I loved the hell out of it. Oh yeah, like I, I will line up to go watch that sequel with Woody Harrelson when it comes out. Oh hell like, yeah! Sign me with the his, fuck up. I'm in with his weird ginger hair and shit. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. That's what. That's the carnage <laughs> I wanted to see all along. <laughs> that's great, dude. That's great. Um, all right, let's jump back to the film here real quick. So you know, <laughs> <laughs> hey, that you know that's... the film. The film we're here to talk about. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, but you know, we want to leave room for these cra- these little tangents and stuff. This is you know, this is where a lot of the fun comes from. But uh, there is a cool. So after it slows down with that moment, we kind of do get back into really the action scenes, and it's pretty much shortly thereafter that Nix and Miles, uh, spoiler alert, record scratch, they end up teaming up. Um, there, it, so, you know, there's that moment where Nick seemingly kills Miles. And I think that's when she's like on top of the car, right? And she's just like blasting away with that giant machine. And was that that moment? No. So I think it's actually shortly after, because when she blasts away at the cops, it's, it's allegedly sometime right after that, that they do meet up and team up. Oh. And then she's like, they're, they're meeting up to fight again. And then she shoots him like four times in the chest which the bulletproof vest thing was telegraphed a little too heavily. <laughs> and the whole, the whole like Nick's being the daughter of the cop thing was also telegraphed pretty heavily. And I'm honestly not sure I needed yeah. any of it in this movie. Like, I don't know if there needed to be more of a twist other than she's just a, a coke headed person who likes to kill people. Like that's, that's, that's enough. I don't really need 
a tragic backstory from her. And if they are going to do it, I think they need to do it better, to be <laughs> honest, because they, they needed they needed to be tropey about it. And I think they tried to almost shoe, shoehorn in a little bit of a serious story uh, halfway through the film, which didn't really work for me. Yeah, it didn't for me either. And look, you know, that's we see this with a lot of films where they're sort of like high concept, right? Where it's all just about like, oh, I've got this crazy idea for this crazy movie. And so you get, you know, half an hour to 45 minutes of really inventive you know, visuals, whatever it is. But it's kind of like with a lot of comedies, right? Where it's like the first hour you're just doing your thing. And then it's like, all right, guys, we got to take a step back now because we're actually telling a story. And now we have to get to the story and wrap things up with the final half hour, right? So I think this film kind of suffers a little bit from that syndrome. Uh, that being said, there's a lot to like in here. So, like, uh, I really – so after they do – it's one of those things when Miles gets shot, you're like, there's no way he's actually dead. You know, it was effectively shot and everything. But you know that, you know, there's just no – like, there's too much movie left. And, you know, he, th there's no way this film's pulling, like, a psycho Alfred Hitchcock move where, you know, now it's going to be Nix's story for the rest of the movie. But it's effectively done. You know, it's a, it's a good way, I suppose, to get them – into the prison complex, which ultimately at the end of the day, I mean, from a plot device standpoint, that's why that exists that way, right? So I've seen it done yep. worse, but uh, either way, you know, so they join up and I did for what, you know, I did like the, uh, even though it's kind of getting a little repetitive at this point, just the violence and everything, I did like the scene where they do infiltrate the prison and it's set to wild one. It could also just be that I really like that song, but anytime you've got, Super cool music set to like big action scenes. It reminded me very much of the scene in Kick Ass, you know, and that was another great scene. Uh, the one with the oh, totally. Yeah. That was a <laughs> that was an incredible scene. I I I had forgotten about actually I'd forgotten about both of those movies, but uh, yeah, Kick Ass had some incredible. I mean, generally the movies they make off Mark Millar comic books like uh, Kingsman. Mm -hmm. Those those all have really well choreographed action, and uh, that's kind of his signature in the books as well. I think I also really like the moment where uh, she loses her fingers, uh, and then she tries to flip him off a little bit later, <laughs> and then she's like, "Wait, hold on!" And she like <laughs> she goes and like picks up her severed finger off the floor and like wedges it in between like her two knuckles to like flip him off. Like, and and much to your point earlier, I think that Nix is probably the best character in the movie. I think I like Nick's probably more than Miles. She's just so badass, and Samara Weaving does an absolutely great job of her characterization. And it's just... But, I mean, look, I think the film sets that up because, like, she is that ultimate badass, right? Like, every action film has the one character who's, like, the badass among badasses. And this movie, they're like, cool, we're gonna make it this, like, you know, young, attractive girl, and she's gonna be the badass, which kind of only makes her a little bit more badass, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that, so the, the aesthetic of the movie is set up really well by the music too. Like you were mentioning mm -hmm. earlier, the, I forget what song is playing when they're doing that final action scene uh, where they're storming, they're storming the, the warehouse. Yeah. I don't, I don't remember. I forget, it was really, it fit really well, but at the beginning, I know they open with a cover of Tears for Fears, You Spin Me Right Round. Oh, which yeah. <laughs> I fucking, I fucking loved. I, they had, a, they had another really good cover immediately after that, too. I almost would have been down for them to do, like, all 80s covers, but in kind of the new neo-techno style. Yeah. That worked really well for me, and I think that that, that generally frames her character really well. But I'm somebody who picks up on, on music and films a lot mm -hmm. and it can really change a character for me or like change the way that we see people and see scenes obviously it's why it's there but it's 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 a big deal to me when a movie has good music so that helped a lot yeah for sure and it's funny too because i think right before that so right before they do the suicide mission that's where like she ends up doing like the she's like about to die and then she ends up doing this like giant rail of meth that like falls out of some dude's thing and then just like goes like Rah! and then just goes absolutely crazy and then i think that leads like right into the sacrifice suicide mission to help miles and so again it's you know not is it artistic no but it was consistent with character and it's the type of movie where yeah again if you want to see a chick do a huge rail of meth and then go on a suicide mission to blow up some evil gangsters in a prison 
this is the movie for you. Yeah, I mean, and the nice thing too is people do get what they deserve in this movie. Like it definitely follows the rules. Mm -hmm. Where when 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 people are dying, they they deserve to die by the rules of the film. Like they've committed some horrible act at some point, and you know, while we like Nyx, she she is like a murdering psychopath. <laughs> you know, yeah, there's no getting around that. not really a lot that we could do to excuse her previous <laughs> behavior. <laughs> so yeah, it's like she has to so die. She's so charismatic the way one. she does it. It's like she kills people, but she's so charming when she does it. So I'm willing to overlook the killing. Yeah, I know. I, I think that that happens with a lot of these movies. Right. And then, but that's, that's why we usually, at the end of a long series, right, it ends with the action hero dying. Because... We have to have some way to reconcile with the fact that this person has killed so many people on screen that we're like, okay, well now now they're dead and resting, so it's okay to look back on that. But it's 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 interesting when it comes into like you know there there are generally rules of when when certain people have to die in a film because they've just become almost unredeemable in in a certain aspect. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, and so you know this film almost does that uh but it doesn't quite so almost <laughs> so when we get to the end by the way i wish it did <laughs> by the way the fact that we haven't even mentioned i think we're about 40 minutes in or something like this on this podcast and we never even mentioned nova yeah, Richter. nova the girlfriend <laughs> so that that yeah, just or, goes or to show we haven't talked about nova or was. richter <laughs> what, i'm sorry was that <laughs> we didn't talk about richter either the oh. villain Oh, you know what? That was just that's an oversight though. I thought he actually did a pretty good job. I I, I mean I love I loved Richter. Yeah, he was a cool Richter character. Richter was fantastic. Yeah, definitely. And uh he was you know, he's got like all the tattoos and you know, he's this big over the top character and then but then he also kinda has these little panicky moments that are kinda done to comedic effect and it was just you could tell, you know He's that, got like whimsy. Yeah, you like could, I love that he's 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 like a psychopath with whimsy, right? Like you can <laughs> tell that He's get he's getting a kick out of the really creepy shit he's doing, and I kind of love to see that in villains. Like, I just watched uh, the Batman series again, the Nolan Batman series, oh, yeah, and yeah, yeah. I love watching Scarecrow. Yeah, like specifically Scarecrow or anything Killian Murphy's in. I would I would watch him play anybody as well. I'd watch him read but a phone book. Dude. He's Scarecrow. Hmm? I said I'd watch him read a phone book. That guy's awesome. Oh, dude, I would, I would too. He's, he's just, he's so damn good, and I hope he's in more stuff once Peaky Blinders is over as well. Yeah. But his scarecrow kind of delights, and I guess the the Joker does it as well. That's it's a pretty well well known thing. But like they delight in the madness that they're having, and I like that little whimsical element in my villains because it's like, it's like a colorful snake, right? Like you want to go touch it because it looks cool, but it's gonna bite the shit out of you. And that's <laughs> that's Richter in a nutshell. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, it's, you know, and it's, you've got a lot of actors where, you know, they just sort of relish these roles and they really sink their teeth into them because they get to play these very sort of theatrical vaudevillian type characters and they don't have to worry about things like, you know, conveying vulnerability and emotion. They just get to have fun with it and show up and be loud and over the top. And so, yeah, this guy totally just, you know, gets into that role and uh, it's a good performance. So, and, and that's not to take anything away from Radcliffe, too. Like, Radcliffe was really good. Like, I mean, for a movie where maybe not a lot is asked of these people in terms of, like, emotional depths, um, they just kind of have to crank it up to 11. Like, each of them does a good job of doing so while also still being likable, right? Like, some, some maybe it's just their, that's organic to their personalities as people. But, you know, sometimes you watch someone over the top, and it's just like, you know what, you, this this is... You're not this type of actor, right? Like, right now, I'm thinking of Tommy Lee Jones in Natural Born Killers. Like, I hate him in that movie because he's trying to play this, like, raving, frothing-at-the-mouth madman. And that's not what Tommy Lee Jones does. Tommy Lee Jones wins Best Supporting Actor for being in The Fugitive, playing down-to-earth normal guys, right? So... You don't get any of that in this film. These or are... or juxtaposed against people, right? Juxtaposed against people who are doing that kind of frothing at the mouth, like Batman Forever. Ex that's uh, the other thing I, I was going to say. <laughs> that's his, his two worst performances are Natural Born Killers and Batman Forever, and it's the two times that he's asked to just go like, blah, and go crazy and over the top. And it's like, nah, dude, like... <laughs> The Coen brothers get in for No Country for a reason, right? Like, you, you cast them in The Fugitive for a reason. Like, let Robert Downey Jr. do all the drugs in Froth at the Mouth, right? 
But I love him as Two Face. He's oh, like, he's like juxtaposed against Carrie's Riddler. No. Batman he's Forever. So okay, Batman Forever is a horror, is a bad movie. Honestly, but I, 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 I love enjoy it. it more than I mean. I used to as a kid. Honestly, I honestly have not seen that movie in ten years on the low end, right? But I saw the shit out of that movie when I was younger. I mean, dozens of times. And kind of like we were talking earlier, it's like. I know I'm with Venom. Like, I know I'm watching a bad film, but I'm still really enjoying it, and I'm totally going to, like, watch it again and again. But even as a kid, yep. and especially when he's up against Jim Carrey, because Jim Carrey does have that natural over the top. And so when you see a uh, when you see a legitimately crazy person acting crazy next to someone who is not legitimately crazy acting crazy, it rings hollow. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I, 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 can, I can get behind that. I can get behind that. <laughs> Sweet. I win so few arguments. Ah, it feels good. I'm going to relish it. Uh, just hold on. But it, yeah, it is funny to see Richter. So, like, Richter specifically, he does do over the top in this, but then he's also in uh, Good Omens, the TV show that was out last year. And his character in that is a bit of a villain, too, but it's, it's more reserved. So, it's kind of interesting to see the two sides of his acting. Interesting. Yeah, no, uh, that was the Neil Gaiman adaptation, right? Yeah, Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett. Speaking of two people who are diametrically opposed, <laughs> making making just absolute magic together. Like you have Monty Python. I, I call Terry Pratchett Monty Python in print, and then working <laughs> with Neil Gaiman, who's a pretty serious author. And they just they apparently they alternated chapters, and that's how they did it. But it is. Good Omens, if you have not read it or watched it. The show is fantastic, and the book is also fantastic. Very cool. Yeah, no, I didn't get to check that one. Yeah. So, so yeah, so let's go ahead and wrap up the film here. So, like we said, Miles almost dies, like both Ashton and I would have liked to have seen. Um, but he, he doesn't. So there's, you know, a more or less tropey rooftop showdown at the very end of the film. Like we said, this is a film that's embraced its tropes so you know it didn't really bother me too much and then you know of course they make mention or make mention try to joke it away or something where he's like ah we're even doing the uh classic rooftop battle at the end and it's like well just because you acknowledge it doesn't make it you know what i mean like (laughs) but anyway so uh they go through this whole thing there's this showdown miles has his last bullet you do think that you know it's going to end with that moment where he's able to effectively shoot what was the bad guy's name again? I keep forgetting his name. Richter. Richter, thank you. Where he's going to shoot Richter, uh, and, you know, he he misses, but then he, like, charges at him and pushes him off the building. And, uh, yeah, so then we get this scene where it looks for a minute like he's going to bleed out. Uh, he's got this, you know, sort of monologue, and he makes this very nice point about how, uh, you know, his girlfriend's there. He had just saved his girlfriend, and, like, rather than getting what I think he says is like a raging lady boner from his efforts at pistol whipping the bad guy. Like she just has PTSD and she's terrified and frightened and just like runs away. So that at least, you know, defied convention. That was a nice little moment. I thought. Yeah. I would have loved if that was like the last line in the movie, because then, then it would have, it would have cast the rest of the movie in a completely different light than what we got. If we cut the movie there, then I do think it's satire. But because of the way they ended it, I think it starts to pull out of satire and into gun porn. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And uh, we, so I actually do have a clip of the ending that I'm going to play for you guys here. So you can actually hear this scene if you haven't seen it or remember exactly what we're talking about. Let's give that a listen. called hemorrhagic shock it that's my body just shutting down from uh yeah massive massive blood loss sorry for the fake out i mean i did kill richter that was real i just didn't get the girl you see in real life watching your ex pistol whip some guy's teeth out gives you ptsd not a raging lady boner Thanks for tuning in, everyone. We've been death tall, and um, remember, like, like, comment. Some people stopped watching Schism that night, but many, many more took their place. (laughs) 
Nova, well, she finally found her superhero. He stands up and fights to make the world a better place. Schism didn't go away. They spread, just like Richter said. And that means I still have a job to do. And I know where they live. So again, for a movie that has embraced its tropes, it almost manages to avoid convention before just not being able to help itself and slipping back into it. And it's funny, Ashton, because that's literally the theme of the entire movie, right? Whether it's the yep. commentary aspects of the live stream or any of the other things. It's like, we're going to dabble in it, but then we're just going to go right back to the boss of the wall action because that's what we're all here for. So, Yeah, and it felt like it was trying to set up a sequel, too. Kind mm -hmm. of with the way it ended, and I'm just like, you know, I, I honestly, I, I don't need it. <laughs> the, the whole the whole point in this movie was somebody had guns stapled to his hands, and you know, they they talk briefly about giving Nova chainsaws for arms. I think Richter pitches that idea, mm -hmm. and uh, Ash vs. Evil Dead did that best. I think we can leave that one alone. <laughs> but like, it's I I don't need any more of this universe. I, I really wish they had capped it with him dying. It would have. It would have bumped my score probably pretty significantly. I, I actually would agree with that. Yeah, I thought it would have just given it a certain resonance that the movie lacks throughout it. So, all in all, very good movie. I did enjoy it. Uh, there was a lot that maybe could have been done to make it a little bit more resonant, a little bit more human. Of course, that's not exactly what this film is trying to say. But it sounds like for both of us, Ashton, you know, because uh, we're both gamers, you know, we're both... 14 year old boys at heart i think at the end of the day with the stuff that we like and so i think this is a movie like we're definitely this movie's target audience and even for us you know it wasn't like a, a five-star experience um there was still just something lacking you know whether it was the repetition whether it was the re lack of emotional investment whatever it was there was just that thing that kept it you know as a good movie instead of a great movie so with that being yeah. with that being said uh, we're still going to go ahead and close out like we do every episode. So, uh, Ashton, this is your first time on the show, obviously. But uh, we wrap up every film with a little uh, feature we call Three Adjectives. So uh, give us your three adjectives that you feel best summarize your experience with this film. So I'm going to go ahead and say frenetic, dissociated, and colorful. And I think that the frenetic and dissociated are kind of combined to form that very much so like violent ADD feel that I felt throughout because it's just, it's fast paced and it doesn't linger on any one, two thought or like one thought very long, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I had three kind of similar ones. Instead of frenetic, uh, I had kinetic, which pretty much, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. But uh, pretty much saying the same thing there. Uh, my second one is that it's uh is is visual. This this might seem kind of I don't know like ridiculous or obvious or something like that, but you know when we especially on this program, you know we watch a lot of different films and we get a lot of films that are maybe a little bit more somber. You know we've had foreign films on here, art films, and a lot of those can be very you know either dialogue driven. Uh, they almost play like stage plays. This is the exact opposite. You know this doesn't have really much if any snappy dialogue. Um, it's just a pure visual experience, you know, except for maybe the Rice Darby scene that we talked about earlier. So, and then the other thing, yep. uh, the other adjective that I have is one note. So this is just a film that came super strong right out of the gate, hit the gas pedal, you know, we're hitting a hundred and you know, 0 0.6, whatever. Uh, but then after that first half hour, it just kind of stays in its lane. Uh, wow. That, that, that worked out. Car metaphors. Awesome. This is a film that I would have liked to see be able to do more than just sort of reiterate the same message over and over and over. But at least it had the good sense to know that it only needed an hour and a half to do that. You know, it didn't try to take up more of our time and turn it into a whole two hour bloated epic and force a bunch of stuff that wasn't there. So overall, still a really enjoyable experience. Ashton, why don't you go ahead and slap a formal star rating out of five stars on Guns Akimbo. What you got? 
So I'm going to give it a 3.75 out of 5. And with the caveat that I probably would have given it a 4.25. So, so an, an extra 0. 0.5 if it had ended the movie with him dying. Wow. A whole difference of a half star for Ashton by not stopping, what, three minutes earlier? Four minutes earlier? Yeah, it should have quit while it was ahead. <laughs> like, like you know, honestly, like subvert my expectations once. Yeah, right. Because it would have made the whole thing worth it. <laughs> Instead, we just get the same old story about a guy waking up with guns bolted to his hands. Yeah. God. <laughs> this tale as old as time. It's basically John Wick. Uh, <laughs> That's awesome, dude. Uh, funny enough, we actually have the same exact star rating. So I gave it 3.75 out of 5. It, You know, there was just... It was something where initially I felt like it was a four-star film. But it's almost like a... It's like the cinematic equivalent of, like, pasta or ramen. You know, you enjoy it when you're done. But then, like, an hour <laughs> yes. and a half later, you're like, I'm still kind of hungry. <laughs> so uh yeah no and and honestly like for me it's like i was stuffing myself with with pasta and ramen in that first 45 minutes and then you know we were at olive garden so they just brought out more <laughs> yeah. and and i'm gonna eat it i'm gonna eat it because i paid for the unlimited pasta but i'm not gonna like myself for it <laughs> and i think that that's very much this movie <laughs> that is an excellent way to bring us out ashton so all right guys that's gonna wrap up the program today uh so Guns Akimbo, like we said, if uh, you're someone that likes super high kinetic, crazy, fast-paced films, check it out. We'll be back in two weeks with a full-length episode. Ashton, really appreciate you hanging out with us, buddy. It's been a lot of fun here. Yeah, thanks for having me. You know, anytime you want to have me back, I'm down. I'm curious to see what we pull next, to be honest. (laughs) Yeah, well, and you know, as I'm sure you know on the full episodes, you know, we do the the random drawings at the end. Uh, We're not going to do that for these half episodes. Um, but, uh, at the same time, it's still kind of random to our listeners because they never really know what they're going to get until we announce it to them. To be honest, we, we don't really either. So we'll see what we got for you guys in two weeks. Thanks for hanging out with us once again on Esoterica Cinema. Before I leave, I will say that you can go ahead and reach out to us if you want on the socials. So maybe you felt like you actually didn't really like this movie at all. Maybe you felt like... Ashton and I aren't really enjoyable to listen to and we need to shut the hell up. Whatever it is, you can reach out. You can tell us. Let us know what you thought. Catch us on Twitter at Esoterica Cinema. And then for some of the older folks, if you like to still do email the way that I do, you can go ahead and reach out to us. Esoterica Cinema at gmail.com. Thanks again for hanging out with us. We'll see you next time on Esoterica Cinema. Hey kids, do you like waking up from a long night's sleep after a vicious gang beatdown with guns bolted to your fists? Well, you're gonna go even crazier when you wake up with spoons for hands. From the makers of Guns Akimbo, it's Spoons Akimbo. Awesome! Experience the thrills of churning through cereal in record time, playing an entire orchestral symphony on your cheeks, and even strutting your mojo while you cosplay as lame Wolverine. I'll scoop your eyes out, Bob. Hey, kids! Do you like waking up with spoons bolted to your hands? Of course you don't! That's fucking stupid! That's why we fired our marketing department and initiated a significant, borderline treasonous payout to the ATF to be able to bring you our latest, most ball-shattering creation to date, Bazooka's Akimbo! Just imagine waking up with two giant-ass bazookas strapped to either side of your body! They're so heavy. Damn right they are, kid, just like my dick. I I can't breathe. That's what she said, bro. Tell my mom I love her. Hey, kids, were you involved in that immense nationwide class action lawsuit over Bazooka's Akimbo? If not, I'm legally required to tell you about our biggest, baddest, most awesomest Akimbo of all time, AIDS Akimbo. Imagine the power of waking up with a massive amount of AIDS free flowing through your body as you. Oh shit, hold up. Guys, guys, guys. We gotta kill this. Why? Because fucking AIDS Akimbo, that's why. The problem? You don't see the problem? Oh, okay. I'm the asshole here. Yeah, I'm the asshole here. Sure. You've got to be fucking kidding me. We're going to get raked over the coals on this one.
From the imagination of acclaimed author Ashton McCauley comes the next great anti-hero in American fiction. His name is Nick Ventner, alcoholic by trade and monster hunter by profession. When Nick gets hired by a wealthy benefactor to find the lost gates of Shangri-La, it's up to him and his crotchety companion James to deliver the goods. The two soon find themselves on the adventure of a lifetime. And in addition to being chased by Nick's longtime rival, Manchester, they soon find themselves being hunted by a mythical and elusive yeti that has been terrorizing the Himalayas. Featuring non-stop action and an acerbic wit, Whiteout by Ashton McCauley is a thriller-minute page-turner you won't be able to put down until it's finished. You can find Whiteout in ebook, hardcover, and paperback versions online and everywhere books are sold. Published by Aberrant Literature.